It was said that the only force more intense than the legendary orc chieftain Kirok the Destroyer's battle lust was his fury when he lost. Kirok would rage for days afterwards, and those prudent stayed out of arm's length to avoid becoming the target of his wrath. And so when an Orkan party was annihilated while making a raid on the human settlement of Rodenburg, resulting in the deaths of Kirok's son, Modric, and his wife, Tanazi. The other orcs were stunned at his reaction. Kirok remained in his tent for an entire day in total silence. Some worried that the Orkan champion had taken his own life out of guilt for not having accompanied his wife and son on the raiding mission. Then, when one of the scouts sent out to search for the party that had killed the group came into the camp, Kirok emerged from his tent, somber but determined. Kirok listened calmly as the scout told him he had spotted a group of humanoids moving through the pass of teeth, and he had seen that they had saddlebags with the unique symbol of the red hand. There was a long moment of silence until finally Kirok's second in command asked him, what should we do? We shall track them down, Kirok told him, and then we shall dismember them limb by limb while they were still alive. I shall grind their bones to bake my bread. Hello gang, K.R. King here helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So this video is a follow-up on the one I did last time uh, in terms of creating a nemesis, arch nemesis for your player characters. And in the intro, I give an example and it was drawn partly uh, from this last video, uh, but partly from some earlier videos, Kirok the Destroyer. Uh, I had done a thing, a long-term rival that I was gonna use in a campaign. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. You know how those internet campaigns, sometimes they come, sometimes they go. I was never able to use them, but I have it all developed. And I adapted it to this. I have a battle in which Kurok has his wife and son killed such that he has an emotional response to this emotional toll, fury. And he, this gives him the opportunity to become a long-term nemesis. And so in the earlier video, I talked about creating one. Now I'm going to talk about how you run uh, a nemesis, how you uh, do their actions, you know, in-game while the players are playing, but then offline, how you think about how they're going to respond, what they're going to do. And then as the game sessions progress, how you run this such that the players begin to realize, you know, someone's after us, something's going on. Because, you know, even though the Nemesis uh, storyline follows some aspects of traditional stories, it deviates in terms of the D&D thing in that it's not the players necessarily initiating the action, but the players reacting to the actions of a Nemesis. Because when you have a, you know, a sandbox campaign, you set things out and you just let the players do what they want to do. But now you're taking an NPC whose actions are directly impacting, you know, the player's intentions or very lives. So in one sense, the arch nemesis storyline is forced upon the players. But of course, it's a reaction to the defeat, you know, the manner of defeat that the players inflicted on the NPC. And then it'll be driven and moved by the player's reactions to, you know, the nemesis. So there's two aspects that you want to think about when creating your storyline for your nemesis. The offline preparation that you have in terms of, you know, what this nemesis is going to do, you know, the activities they're going to make. And then the in-game, you know, reactions from the players uh, that can alter, you know, these preparations. So the offline work can't, you know, begin uh, until, you know, the players inflict some defeat on an enemy and it has the emotional toll that I talked about that creates a nemesis response. Now, and the important thing is you can, you know, if this defeat occurs at the beginning of a session and you've got three hours to go, uh, and let's say the players decide right after this battle to take a long rest, right? Well, you know, if, for instance, creatures fled and they go to a larger host of creatures and they come back and the players are still there, you're going to have a confrontation. You know, if the players follow the, you know, fleeing creatures and meet the larger host, again, a confrontation. If any of these things occur as the game session is going, uh, you may not have a, you know, long-term nemesis situation because it's resolved. Either the players kill the rest of the NPCs, the NPCs kill them, or the NPCs inflict damage on the group uh, who then flee such that their emotional response has been muted. The thing is, you want a nemesis to grow organically out of actual play, not just because you want to have one. So I would only start the offline process of building the nemesis if, you know, the 
players move away and can't be found or, you know, there's no way for the NPCs to regroup and have an attack in that session. You know, then you want to think about the NPC or monster in terms of its sophistication and power relative to the players and how, what the activities it could take in order to, you know, enact its revenge. So one of the things in my example uh, that I use with Kurok is that the players have killed all of the orcs. The reason for this is, you know, if any of the orcs get away and he finds out that, you know, potentially his son or wife is going to be killed, he's going to haul ass to get back there and find out what's going on. He's going to want to confront the players. But in this circumstance, it makes sense that all the orcs stay and none flee. Why? Because are you as an orc going to flee this battle, go to Kirok and say, I left your wife and son at the mercy of these humans? You're not going to do that because he's just going to kill you, right? You're going to fight to the death. So the players move off and they continue the session. And one of the things, how long does an orc and raiding party go out? You make a judgment call. Let's say you say they always go out like three days, you know, a day and a half or two days out and two days back, something like that. And then you just decide where are they, you know, 1D4, how many days out are they? Are they on their way back, you know? And so that will determine when they show up missing, right? Because all the orcs were killed. So if they've already been out, you know, it's two days and then they realize something's up. Now they've got to figure out where they were. They've got to track them. Maybe they take the same path. Maybe that's easy to do. Maybe not. But, you know, in terms of tracking, you know, even if they find the site of the battle uh, to track the players three days out, that's plus five on a tracking in terms of DC for each day, you know, and we're in difficult terrain with the barren hills, this sort of thing. Even if you had, you know, a Claw of Luthic or character with a plus four survival, uh, proficiency, it's going to be tough. So unless, you know, they were due back just that day, unless this happens to happen near the Orkin village or something, and again, you're letting this happen organically, you're not forcing things, but if, unless those occur, Kurok's going to probably have to figure out some other means of discovering who these people were that killed his, you know, group, and how do I find them? So you want to think about a believable chain of events for Kurok to make this discovery. And some of this, depending on how long you're running and how much time goes by, could be occurring, you know, offline during the game session. So the first thing is, are there any clues at the scene of the battle when Kurok arrives that give him information? And again, you may say, well, I don't ask my players, did you forensically clean that battle site such that no one could follow, you know, you don't say that, and if you did suddenly, they'd be like metagame, like what's going on? So in terms of running like a lot of things, the judgment call, if you've got a group of fifth level characters who have, you know, never been tracked from a battle uh, in their history and, and they it killed all the opponents, why would someone track them? You know, they're not necessarily going to make sure there is no evidence of them being there. Unless, of course, they were on this mission to get, you know, find out about these orcs. They don't want to be, uh, you know, investigated. But again, they, they have to come up with that themselves. If not, they didn't try to clean up necessarily. But of course, what can Kirak tell? You know, looks for footprints. How many were there? Whatever. You know, it's a pretty chaotic scene. Tons of footprints. Would a ranger even be able to tell? But you know, what about the bodies? What do the wounds look like? Could Kirak recognize magic damage? Uh, could he tell the difference between a broadsword cut and a rapier? Are there any used arrows lying around or other, you know, thrown weapons? Anything that would give him a clue of what sort of, you know, creatures these, these are that killed uh, his group? Where are they from? And these are all things that you're thinking about either in-game while you're running the other game or afterwards that Kurok would be during, doing during the time period that you're running in-game. So maybe, you know, Kurok takes the bodies back to town to have a proper burial, but sends scouts out to see if they can see anything, you know, groups or monsters or whatever that fit in terms of the wounds that they've seen on these bodies. And, you know, depending on how much time passes in the game, do the players pass back through here? Do they keep going somewhere? Do they take another route back uh, to Dragos, which in my campaign is their home village? Uh, are there, because it's the Barren Hills, only certain passes that can be watched? I use this example of the, you know, passive teeth sort of thing, uh, such that these Orkin, you know, scouts could spot a group. And then again, I had this where they took the saddlebags with the handprint. You know, would they necessarily just have them on the side of their horses or mules or whatever? Maybe. And again, do the scouts send someone back to warn Kurok? Continue to follow the players. And if the players stop somewhere, they found the dungeon they're exploring or, you know, something. If there's time for Kurok to come back and have, you know, a confrontation, then it should happen. 
Because even though you're going to be making some offline decisions as to what Kurok does, it should always reflect, you know, actions of the players. So as time goes by, the players do their activities and whatever they go to town, the session ends, you keep track of that time, you have an idea of how much time for Kurok to react, to investigate, you know, to have his burial or whatever, such that now if the game session ends, you're ready to think about, you know, in more detail what he's going to do. Because it's interesting, in my earlier example of Kirok, he wanted to uh, reunite the tribes. He's this charismatic, very intelligent chieftain. Uh, reunite the tribes and retake their ancestral homes of the Barren Hills. So he was undermining this settlement of Rodenburg. And he wasn't going to sacrifice his position. He was keeping himself secret. He was trying to turn the humans against each other. But now we have an emotional toll of fury that may cause Kurok to make decisions that aren't necessarily in the interests of that long-term goal. So if he has an insider in town, someone working for him, he may make the rare and very risky move of actually appearing in town to question this guy. Did you see someone here? You know, what can you tell me? Was there a group of, you know, adventurer types or whatever? And if he's not satisfied with this information and he thinks the townspeople know something, he could reveal himself and kidnap, you know, members of the town, uh, you know, kill them. And again, depending on the tone of your campaign, these could be children because, you know, Kurok is a nasty mother. But in addition to being nasty, Kurok is also a very smart orc. And he may decide to enact his revenge, you know, long term without jeopardizing his, you know, long term plans about the Barren Hills. Well, let's say he determines that it's a group of, you know, humanoids, player character types, and their home base is Dragos, either because of his operative uh, in Rodenburg, uh, perhaps it's from the clues that he got at the battle site, perhaps it's from the Orc and Spies, or they follow them, something like that. The well, thing is, Kurok may have his own operatives in Dragos itself. Because he may trade, you know, in illicit, uh, you know, booty from uh, raids. Let's say he raids a merchant caravan and he takes the stuff from there and he gets things from these, you know, uh, operatives that he couldn't get ordinarily. You know, weapons, armory, tools, you know, healing potions, etc. Kurok has a relationship with these illicit traders. You don't have to even think of like rogues or maybe cultists or, you know, a warlock or even just some sketchy merchant. You know, Kurok could pay these people for information on the group, and he could pay for them to mess with the group. He could try to undermine their position within the city. He could have an assassin steal something from the players' rooms and then leave it on the body of a gruesomely murdered leading citizen. He could have them plant treasonous pamphlets, you know, calling for the overthrow of the Baron, and tip off the city guard. The city guard come, they find this stuff, and at, at the least, the players are going to be questioned, they could possibly be expelled from Dragos or, you know, at the worst, they could be held in the keep until the authorities get to the bottom of this. You know, and all these activities are going to take time. They're going to unfold over several sessions. Soon enough, the players are going to begin to realize, you know, somebody is, somebody's messing with us. Somebody is doing these things. And, of course, there's a caveat here in terms of Kurak personally doing this. Not only does he have interest to keep himself hidden away, I guess, but... How are orcs, you know, handled in your world? Do you have a typical D&D, traditional one, where the orcs are outsiders, they would never be allowed in the city walls? Or do you have something where there is some interaction? You know, I am running a frontier campaign. Maybe they would interact. Obviously, if Kurek were a half-orc, that'd be a different situation. But when I set this figure up, he was an orc. I'm not going to change that just to create a nemesis situation. It's got to come from the actual activities that are occurring. And, of course, the other thing that Kurok can do is the old catfish deal where he creates a false personage who is messing with the players you know someone who's not who they seem to be and so they're going to the players tracking this down having no idea it's him he leads them out to the barren hills where he can capture them because that is Kirok's ultimate goal to capture the group and to kill them in the most uncomfortable way possible and by capturing them he can prolong the experience because this is a classic response to the fury and humiliation emotional toll of a defeat. Uh, the nemesis wants their enemy to feel that same anguish that they felt only 10 times worse. And the means that the nemesis has is a reflection of their power vis-a-vis -vis the players. You know, Kurok's entire tribe altogether could probably overwhelm a five fifth level characters, but how are they going to get there? How are they going to all, you know, surround them? 
you know, and again, the thing is to lure them there, either through this false personage, you know, it was something, Kurok is killing villagers at Rodenburg and he leaves clues, he leaves them himself, that lead them to an area where there's a trap. If the players are exiled from Dragos, they're going to be like, who did this? They're going to look for this. If it's a false personage, you know, again, Kurok could be leaving clues that lead to some, you know, they're hiding out in the barren hills, something like that, where he can capture them. You know, the operatives could give the players false information about this false personage, right? Or the, you know, operative could have the old fake treasure gambit where they come to them, they say, I, I know about this map or the secret temple, but I need protection. It's in the Barren Hills. Off we go. You know, the players, there's Kirok waiting. Uh, and Kirok could kidnap one of the players, take them back to the village, you know, set up the ceremonial sacrifice thing. Are the players just going to allow this to happen? Probably not. They're going to try to rescue him. So all this is predicated on a line of attack that makes sense in terms of what Kirok's you know, intelligences and power vis-a-vis -vis the players. And you want this to unfold over multiple sessions. You don't want to tip your hand on this too much. You know, even if the players begin to suspect that something as strange is going on, you know, you don't want to lead to that. It starts with something like, but you think maybe someone's been in your room at the tavern. Uh, the authorities come by, they're questioning the players about pamphlets that have been distributed calling for the overthrow of the Baron, and the players have no idea, and then the authorities come back and they investigate the rooms of the pla They find pamphlets under the floorboards. Maybe it's from the previous tenant. Maybe the authorities believe them. Maybe not. You know, a good friend of the players is found outside the city's walls with his throat slit. A random robbery? Because here's the thing. If you can create a nemesis storyline over time, over multiple sessions, and the players slowly begin to realize they've got this enemy, and the nemesis reacts to their actions in a believable way, they're going to really like this because it makes your world seem real and it makes it seem sophisticated. You know, the NPCs aren't just wielding weapons and fighting. They're thinking, they're plotting, they have goals. And if you've liked what you've seen, please subscribe. Please leave some comments. Most importantly, my friends, keep playing D&D &D and tell somebody else about it.